Welcome to the God With Us podcast. Today we're talking about seeking God's nearness and love. I was trying to get that settled up. So welcome. Seeking awareness. Seeking awareness. Here we go. My name is Jeff Holsklaw, and I'm sitting here with my wonderful wife, Sid Holsklaw. Hello. We are broadcasting live here on YouTube and Facebook, or you're listening to us on uh, your podcast player, wherever <laughs> you find us on Spotify, on iTunes, or wherever that might be. So we're so glad that you're here with us today. We're continuing our second season where we are kind of using this Ignatian spirituality, Ignatian practices as ways of jumping into conversations about our relationship with God, God with us, neuroscience, uh, attachment, um, everyday life, and all sorts of other things. And what's our theme? We're trying. What are the all the, the like four or five eyes that we're trying to integrate? Into yeah. Our- so we came up with these on our last episode. Let's see if we can remember them all. It was uh, integrating our intellect and our imagination. And responding to God's invitation to transformation, there to intimacy, to much. intimacy. Uh, no, I don't like that word. All right, to transformation. I'm a guy. You, know, you wouldn't like too that much, word. Too much All right. So, what are we talking about today? Today, we're talking about how God is always near, and how He loves us without any conditions or qualifications, and how that can impact our daily lives. To know that. All right. Excellent. Now, you have a kind of a traumatic story you were gonna. Yeah. Up with. So. We were actually going to start this podcast a week or two ago, um, but we had complications because uh, I actually got COVID from a good friend of mine who maybe we don't have to talk about that whole story. (laughs) Um, But I was sort of isolating myself in, we have a three stall garage and one of those garage stalls is converted into a youth room for our church. Mm -hmm. And so we have a projector and some couches in there. And so I was going to go live out in the garage for 10 days to keep the rest of the family from getting sick. Now people might not know this, but I am somewhat tall. Yes. And you're somewhat not as tall. I'm, I'm not as tall. When we sit like this, if you're watching us, it's because Jeff is sitting on an exercise ball, so he looks shorter, and I'm sitting on a high chair so that we don't have to have this huge level change between us. So usually when she needs to reach something high, like the projector in our garage for quarantine when you're with nobody and you're by yourself, so you might as well watch more. Well, you know, like I was going to watch a movie or, yeah. or whatever. Yeah. So what happened? So I was not there. So Jeff was not there. And I didn't want to ask any of my kids who are all taller than me to come and turn on a projector. So I stood on a stool to turn on the projector. And when I stood on the stool, I had turned on the projector and I was waiting for it to warm up. And while I was waiting for it to warm up, the stool just completely like shattered. And so the stool went one way and my feet went with it and my head went the other way and I smacked my head really, really hard on a table on the way down. And then I'm so grateful that I didn't land on top of all of the shards of stool so I didn't get puncture wounds anywhere. Um, but I did end up with some beautiful bruises. Do you remember how beautiful you that shoulder missed, bruise I had? The oh, it was so pretty. You okay. buried the headline. What happened to your brain? I got a concussion. Yes. And so when I got that concussion, then I had to be off screens in dim places without bright lights. And so not only was I in isolation in my garage, I was also not even able to read anything or listen to anything or watch anything for the first several days. Uh, It was really quite the experience. Mm -hmm. Remember last time in our last episode, we talked about that Richard Rohr quote about when you lose control and you lose any ability to fix it and you lose any influence (laughs) over your life, that it's a spiritual moment. Well, that was a spiritual moment. Mm -hmm. Anyway, um, The thing that was interesting to me is that, see, I just told that story without explaining what I felt like I had to explain the first couple times that I told that story. When people found out, what? You got a concussion? What happened? Mm -hmm. I would retell the story. And the way that I told it was, and I stood on the stool and I had stood on the stool hundreds of times before. And other members of my family had also stood on the stool. And I felt this compulsion to sort of justify and defend that standing on the stool was a perfectly reasonable thing for me to do. You wanted to make sure people didn't think you were a klutz or being unneedly risky or that this had happened that people had stood on this before. Right, right. 
And the reason I felt like I needed to do that comes out of um, parts of my childhood. I felt like I had always been sort of criticized for not thinking things through or for acting impulsively or, um, you know, some of that kind of stuff. And so it's like I anticipate that when I tell Jeff, I stood on the stool and it broke, even though this would not happen, I still have this internal anticipation that he would be like, why did you stand on the stool? That was so stupid. What were you thinking? Which he wouldn't do. But mm -hmm. it's it's like that's so deeply ingrained in me that that narrative is there. And so this has come up and I'm going to counseling right now from what we talked about in that last episode about like, I want to be more and more and more transformed. And so all the different ways that I can possibly do that. So I'm doing some neurotherapy kind of stuff in counseling. And uh, so the, the practice that I was given was practice not defending yourself, practice mm -hmm. not justifying the choices that you make. And so that's why I can now tell that concussion story without having to explain that it was personally reasonable for me to stand on the stool. But anyway, the reason I bring that all up is because it's the background for the Ignatian exercises that I did is because I could finally read again a little bit. And um, as I could also, part of what I did at the very end of my quarantine and isolation was I was able to listen to episodes of The Chosen. Um, so The Chosen, if you're not familiar with it, is a um, TV series. Um, it's on VidAngel, and it's it's a it's an original series that is going through the life of Jesus through the eyes of the people that he chose to follow him. So you see it through the life of Peter, through Mary. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, I won't go into too many details, but the very first James episode, and John and his mother, right? It's fantastic. By the way, I am not always a big fan of Christian movie television kinds of things, but seriously, this is like, it's incredible. And I think it's a really good companion to this approach to reading scripture imaginatively. Mm -hmm. um, so I do recommend it. But the very first episode is about Mary Magdalene and, uh, they t the the uh, the text of Isaiah 43 is a strong part of that episode and the very first reading in the um Ignatian adventure by Kevin O'Brien is Isaiah 43 and so having just listened to that episode during my quarantine and also um finally able to read scripture again um i just want to read Isaiah 43 to you a minute and uh, just part of it. I won't read the whole thing. Um, but Isaiah 43. But now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Mm -hmm. And I, when I read that that first day, it was almost like it just took my breath away because of the work that I've been doing in counseling and because of um, just having been all alone in the garage for 10 days. Mm -hmm. um, that sense of like, God calls me by name. Uh, and then also I, this is another great book that I enjoy. Uh, it's kind of washed out. It's a yellow cover with. All right. Well, it's called Centering Prayers. It's by Peter Trabenhaus. It's in the show notes. Uh, but the prayer that I was reading that particular day was October 5. And it was, Holy Spirit, draw me deeper into the wonder of your rest. Whatever occurs in my external life today, I wish to remember that my inner life is hidden in God through Christ always. So it is, and so it shall be. And so as I was meditating on that throughout the day, it just was so overwhelmingly beautiful to me that I don't have to defend myself from you. Mm -hmm. I don't have to defend myself with other people. I don't have to justify myself all the time because my inner life, my soul, all of me is safe and hidden and I cannot be overwhelmed by flames or by water or by any words that anybody else might say. I wrote in my journal that day, um, I cannot be attacked or harmed or burned or washed away because God has redeemed me and I am his. I need not fear or defend myself because I am safe. I am accepted. I belong. 
Oh, and then we're also doing a series of Revel on Revelation mm -hmm. at church. And so I was reading Revelation 22 earlier this summer, and it really stood out to me that in Revelation 22, it talks about how when the worshipers are before the throne of the Lamb, that they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. Mm -hmm. And so not only does God call me by name, but he's also written his name on my forehead as a sign of belonging, that I belong to him, that I'm precious to him. And so just really thinking this week about how those words are my identity, they're my defense, they're mm -hmm. my safekeeping. And so when I do feel attacked or under scrutiny, going back to that, like God has, do not fear for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name and you are mine. Mm -hmm. And in that episode of The Chosen too with Mary Magdalene, it's such a powerful moment when Jesus speaks those words over her. Do you remember that? Mm, uh, yeah, absolutely. She was, um, she, you know, she made a lot of bad choices in her life. She was kind of far from her family and she wasn't even going by her given name. She had kind of given herself a new name uh, and her life was just kind of ruined. And there's a point in the episode where uh, she, people had tried to help her, tried to deliver her. She, you know, she's being oppressed by, you know, spiritual forces or these types of things. And it was only when God called her by name, by her real name, by like, you know, the intimate kind of knowing her that she was changed and she was delivered. And I, I think that I'm just thinking through that this is like the week of preparation or the time of preparation in the spiritual practices. And this invitation to transformation starts with uh, God, both um, us seeking God's presence, but also the awareness that God knows us by name. And I think mm. that that's really important as we think through uh, like the understanding of belonging or kind of an understanding of a secure base for like attachment theory. So in Ignatian spirituality, it really talks a lot about detachment from the world, right? but that's only because it's already started with a strong attachment, attachment to God. And so this idea that God knows us by name is supposed to lower our defenses. It's supposed to kind of calm us uh, in our bodies and our minds so that we can kind of move forward. And then the fact that God has given us his name has welcomed us into his family creates this opportunity for true growth because if you're you can't be transformed if you're defending yourself you can't be changed if you're always battling the world or maybe battling your own past and your own ghosts and like all these types of things if you're battling everything then there's no place for growth and change and so only when we can be like oh like i'm seen i'm known i'm understood uh then that's where you can move forward and so the challenge or the invitation for all of us is with God, but then, you know, if you're a spiritual seeker or if you're just kind of getting, you know, it, like religion is not just the formalities of going to church or doing these types of things or all these rituals, really following Christ or knowing God is all about being known. Mm -hmm. uh, so a lot of times we get those things backwards and we talk about this in our book and in the uh, last season in the podcast, it's not so much about knowing who God is. It's rather knowing that God knows us. Right. And not only does he know us by name, but he has called us by name. And so that sense that God is seeking us out, he's not just waiting to be found. He's actually pursuing. He's calling. He's inviting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so that makes me think of another one of the readings for this, for this week was Psalm 131. And I love this because it speaks to what you were just talking about, of that attachment with God and that calmness in his presence. Because it's, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. My soul is like the weaned child that is with me. And so if you've ever been around, um, if you're not a parent, if you've been around other people who are parents, and especially if a woman is breastfeeding her baby, when a bait like <clears throat> when our kids, like I couldn't sleep in the same room sometimes because they could just smell that I was in the room because yeah. that's like they're, they're that tuned in to their source of nourishment. And so if a baby is hungry and you put it anywhere near its mother, they just, they're restless. They will not calm down because they just want to be fed. And so that big difference of when you stop breastfeeding a child and they're starting to eat solid food and they're no longer breastfeeding, then like there's a different quality of being around mom. Mom is just soothing. There's no longer this like needy anxiety of I need to eat. I'm so hungry. Mm -hmm. um, and so that calmness that comes with all of my needs are met all of me is satisfied and I am safe and I am warm and I'm held by this person who loves me. And so that sense of God is saying that about us um, in this Psalm of David, he's saying, I've calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother. And that's talking about the attachment with God. And so 
that sense of when I'm with God, I need nothing. I am calm. All my needs are met and I'm taken care of. So that was another one of the scriptures that was this week about like, it makes a difference when we know that God seeks us out. He has redeemed us. He's called us by name. He's with us. We belong to him and he's met all of our needs so that we don't have to be so anxious and desperate to get our needs met. Mm -hmm. We don't have to, you know, grasp and control and everything else. So, Amen. Yeah. I, I'm still not used to how much or how little you're going to talk this season. Because <laughs> what do you I'm, mean? I talk. <laughs> I added things. Yeah. So um, another thing that was standing um, out to me, one of the other texts this week was Psalm 23. And I ended up talking to Jeff about this because I don't know Hebrew like he does. And so I, um, you know, I could figure it out using tools. But so Psalm 23, which we've probably many of us have read many, many a time, but it's at the beginning, it's he makes me lie down in green pastures mm. and coming right out of this experience of the concussion where I had no choice but to lay down and rest and um, just spend time thinking and and being in the presence of God. It was the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down. And I came to Jeff and I was like, that's standing out to me in a new way today. The makes me lie down, not yeah. invites so, me to lay down, but makes me. Right. And I think uh, we really believe that God invites us to all these, you know, these things and that uh, God is not coercive, but there is that sense in that passage that, that he's compelling, you know, he's compelling me to lay down. Uh, and, and I think through lots of things that God has made us, uh, as we talked about before, embodied people, creatures, creation, uh, who have a regular rhythm and we have to sleep. So we, mm -hmm. we will sleep about a third of our lives. Uh, and that's how God made us. And yes. so there's, there's like, and when we violate our sleep, uh, you know, you have bad health, stress goes way up, you know, you literally will go crazy if you know, you're sleepless long enough. And so God does compel us to lay down in a real sense with our sleep cycles and these types of things. And so there is, can we join God with some of those? He makes me lie down. Like you said, like, well, you got a concussion. So now you're laying down. Now you can do nothing. You can't drive in a car. You can't watch a show. You can't do anything. So what yeah. Do you do? Well, and I didn't read it in like a forceful or, or not uh, like a violence or a violation, but it is kind of like sometimes, you know, you have to hold a crying kid and you have when someone's hysterical, you have to keep them from hurting themselves. You have to do these things. It's loving, but it is more than just talking or is yeah. more than just it's more of a it's more than a suggestion yeah it's more than a suggestion and so instead of why don't you lie down for a while it's like here this is for your good yeah. just lay right. down for a bit right. and yeah. so what are the places that maybe god is inviting us but maybe almost compelling us into uh to be beyond our comfort zone or to lay down things uh that we spend a lot of time in or uh or you know who yeah. knows what how is god compelling us but for our our are good because God is a good shepherd. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then along with that shepherd language, another text for this week was Luke 12, um, the end of it. And so in verse 32, it really still like, do not be afraid again, that do not be afraid. Do not fear. I have redeemed you. I am with you. Like that mm -hmm. pulls up that language right. again. Um, but do not be afraid little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Mm which really stood out to me too, to give you the kingdom. It's the father's good pleasure, not only to be near you, not only to be loving you, not only to be calling you by name, but to give you the kingdom. The whole, like mm. it's Amen. astonishing and surprising and go ahead. So while we're called to seek an awareness of God's nearness and love, uh, and it feels like, well, we have to do those things. It's really when we seek that, we find out that God is seeking us, that he is working toward us, that he is moving toward us in these different ways. And that he, that God is actually wanting to do a lot of the work with us. It's not just us that have to do all the work. Yeah. And just that language of to, it's his good pleasure to give us the kingdom rather than like you have to go out and grab or work to find it. Like it's like, yes, we seek the kingdom, but the king, but it's the father's good pleasure to give it to us mm, when we amen. seek it. And that was stirring up in me this week too. Just like my, my, um, you know, raising kids. And my illusions of being able to exert influence over like what fields they're planted. Cause it was like lilies of the field is in that one is in mm -hmm. that text too. And so like my, my illusion of being able to like exert influence over like, where are they planted and what plants are growing up around them in the influences of their life and um, where they're going to take root. And this idea of like their growth 
is something that, of course, I get to participate in, but ultimately it's God's growth in them, God's invitations to growth in them, and um, God's giving them the kingdom. And that took a lot of the pressure off for me again. And I know that that sounds obvious and clear, but it stood out in a new way. So for God with us podcast, we are seeking God's presence in everyday life, seeking to integrate intellect and imagination and all those types of things. So the everyday life of falling off a chair and clunking your head and being compelled to to rest and uh, invited into an awareness of God's presence. Are you wrapping up? I thought I was. Is there a lot more? You got a lot more on the sheet there? <laughs> no, that's all right. I can be done. <laughs> okay. I can be done because I could talk all day I, I about know. how near God is and how much he loves us. Yeah. So, Well, good. Well, we'll right at that good 20 minute mark. Which all right. Well, we'll wrap it up then. Can I end with a prayer or no? Yes. Okay. So this is a good one. It's uh, the Anima Christi is an ancient prayer, but a guy named David Fleming did an updated translation of it. So I am going to read that. So it's, um, Jesus, may all that is you flow into me. May your body and blood be my food and drink. May your passion and death be my strength and life. Jesus, with you by my side, enough has been given. May the shelter I seek be the shadow of your cross. Let me not run from the love which you offer, but hold me safe from the forces of evil. On each of my dyings, shed your light and your love. Keep calling to me until that day comes when, with your saints, I may praise you forever. Amen. Amen.